Hello and welcome to another virtual program from Turnstile Tours. My name is Stefan D.W. and as is often the case, I'm here to talk with you about New York City's waterfront. Uh, today we are joined by Jonathan Atkin and we'll uh, be taking a look at the harbor through his lens, quite literally. Jonathan Atkin, ship shooter, has a career as a photographer of ships uh, in New York Harbor and elsewhere. Uh, for, almost exclusively from the air, from uh, helicopters and from drones. Uh, if you're new to our programs, I hope you'll consider uh, subscribing in the future. Uh, we've been cycling through our upcoming programs and the ways that you can subscribe. Uh, of particular note, on December 2nd, I believe it is, we have a program uh, of interest to people interested in maritime, which will look at uh, the new uh, South Brooklyn Ferry, part of uh, New York's NYC Ferry, and look at uh, the sites from that route and how that route is changing the city. But uh, let's get right into the incredible photos we have here and the great conversation ahead of us with Jonathan Atkins. So if you'd like to join us, Jonathan, uh, go ahead and there you are. Hello. Hello. Good Pleasure night. to have you with us today. Uh, so I uh, want to get into our photos uh, quickly, but I also want to know a little bit. This seems this is a very unusual uh, occupation you have. How do you, did you find yourself? How did this happen? How do you get into? Uh, how do you become the ship shooter? I have been photographing ships uh, uh, since I was eighteen as a merchant seaman, and then. Uh, I've uh, been around ships because of my father's involvement in the shipping industry. But as a commercial photographer, uh, as a, uh, I was primarily doing a lot of work for the New York Times travel section. And I became sort of the go-to guy for photographing the new cruise ships. And um, that blossomed into a larger, uh, pretty much a, a larger effort to do more than simply cruise ships, but the number of cargo ships in the world is far and it exceeds even one or two cargo lines have more ships than the entire cruise industry. Well, that's, uh, I feel that alone suggests a whole panoply of questions and I'm sure uh, we'll get a lot of those from our folks in the audience. So uh, if you're in the audience, we uh, would love to have you engage with us and ask questions of, of Jonathan. Uh, the best way to do that is through the chat box you see at the bottom. So you can just put your uh, your question in there and my colleague Andrew Gustafson will make sure I see that question and I'll pass that on to Jonathan here. So, uh, and also let us know where you're from. Introduce yourselves to one another. Uh, you can also keep your comments private by selecting all panelists instead of all panelists and attendees. And uh, one other access point for those of you who prefer to uh, read what's being said, you can use the closed captioning and you won't miss a thing. Uh, all right, well, we've got uh, people chimed in from all over the place, from New York City, from Cape Cod, and, uh, and beyond, uh, even Massachusetts. But let's take a look at what it is you do here. All right, uh, so I'm looking at a photo here that's, uh, wow, this is, this really encompasses your Harbor to me. It's uh, only a few elements, but it kind of tells the whole story. Uh, I see the Statue of Liberty, downtown Manhattan. Uh, a, this, I believe, is this is the, the Theodore Roosevelt, the uh, extremely large uh, container ship. Yes. And it looks like the Andrew J. Barberi ferry boat. So we've got uh, commercial shipping, we have moving people. Uh, and this city environment. Uh, what, what do you see when you look at this photo? Absolute drama. Um, the choreography of ships, tugs, the, the weather, the skies, the, even, the, even the, the pattern of the wakes uh, create the photograph. I see that, I see that. Uh, great. And is this, typical of your photography or is this, uh, is, is this basically what you do, a lot of what you do? In terms of the style of photograph, I have to tell a story and that is really what I do is, is to tell a story. And so this establishes, um, it is the reveal, it is the shot that establishes what's going on. But a lot of my photography is very up close and personal within one or two rotor lengths of the ship itself. So that's been sort of my right. trademark of being super close. Well, let's move into that and see some of that here. 
Oh, before we get to that, let's see how you do it. So this is you in the helicopter and one of, them. one of them. And then this is, is this the same helicopter? I uh, know this is a, the original, the first pic, uh, picture was of a Schweitzer piston 300 C, which is a design that hasn't changed since the fifties. But I also use Bell jet Rangers, uh, which are jet turbine helicopters and a little more uh, substantial. So this is what it looks like uh, when you're actually doing the work. This is uh, absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Uh, and um, a little queasy making. You're uh, I'm sure you're strapped in very well there. Well, I'm strapped in. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be able to move around to get the shots you want as well, though. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, there's it's uh, the likelihood of falling out of a helicopter is pretty zero because of the centrifugal forces. I mean, I'm doing acrobatic flying. And uh, in this picture, it's a shot. It's one of the two or three shots I've done in the past two years with a, with a fisheye lens. Uh, I rarely use it. But this uh, suggests um, that we're really very close. See, if this were not a fisheye lens, you would essentially be able to lick the bow of that ship. Wow. Wow. I mean, we were very close. All right, so we're, we're looking at the harbor here. Uh, oh, we do have a question. Uh, do you work with the same pilots a lot? Absolutely. Um, I, without in, uh, insulting my great pilots, I have two here in New York who I work with uh, constantly and they have trained me and I've trained them. I've taken helicopter flight lessons so I can speak helicopter as well as speak ship. Uh, so I, I understand what translational lift is. I understand what settling with power is. Uh, I understand different helicopters and how they can attack the wind. Um, so yes, I use two pilots who we think pretty much on the same page. Uh, we don't have to really, uh, uh, they know what I want. In other cities and other harbors, um, that's a different story, but I, I have a way of finding the best pilots I can. What do you look for in a pilot? A great number of hours in his logbook for safety. I don't fly with low hour pilots um, because it, there isn't a lot of redundancy in helicopters. Um, and then I look for pilots who have had maritime or over water experience uh, and over ships because ships themselves create massive amounts of turbulence, even if they're running at eight knots. Um, they, uh, if a pilot is not aware of that or isn't prepared for that, and the way I fly is I go right over the ship, I go right over the midships, I have the bow, bow wave of air, I have the midships turbulence, and then I have the stern tur turbulence. And you need a pilot who's, who understands how to control his helicopter the way I need it to be controlled. We've got a whole lot of questions come in here. I, uh, uh, We'll uh, try to address them as we go through. Uh, but um, do you, uh, this, one of them really gets to the core of what you do. Uh, Carolyn wants to know if you have to get permission from the ships to photograph them. Most of the, I would say 90% of all the photographs I do are commissioned by the ship company. So not only do I have permission, they are welcoming me. The captain I've had probably several days of communications back and forth with quite a number of people involved in the shoot. And it's usually, uh, the usual suspects are a minimum of six to eight people. And there are over 40 people involved in the, in the email CCs who are all affected by what I'm asking the ship to do, often choreographing it and creating a navigational pattern for the ship for, for the photo op. But indeed, they, um, they know I'm coming. That, I think that answers a lot of, of the questions here. Uh, there, there's one more before we get into sort of the, the narrative we have here. Uh, uh, do you also work, we've seen your helicopters, do you work with drones? And if so, how much drone work versus helicopter work do you do? Most of my work is still about 90% with manned uh, robust helicopters. There's nothing better than a robust helicopter. It, you have no lack of, you have no limit of payloads, you have no limit of time, no limits of for all intents and purposes weather and you don't have to go through a lot of uh, uh, regulatory hoops but i would say five or ten percent at best uh is drones but within very limited spaces and places particularly in new york harbor where 
I have to follow very strict and stringent uh, FAA rules and, and other uh, issues with uh, uh, other regulatory agencies as well. Okay. Great, yeah, um, there's a lot in there. Uh, so what we're looking at here, uh, this looks like the Verrazano Narrows, which is a big piece of the definition of the harbor and just sort of ringed by bridges here. And, uh, and you know, what, what do you see when you see this, uh, when you're looking at this photo? The Narrows and the, I mean, all the bridges in New York are just amazing visual um, players uh, because the weather in New York Harbor can change on a dime. And, and they all become uh, just brilliant counterpoints to the organic sense of the ship. And to incorporate them is, a, is always a challenge. Uh, and every, even though New York offers an archetype, uh, a, a, a plethora of, of beautiful spots and, and things to have as a backdrop, I don't treat them as backdrops. They are integral to the duet, the visual duet with the ship. Uh, wow, uh, just enormous number of, of questions coming in here. Uh, I don't have a good sense with the cloud cover in this particular photo. It's a little hard to get a sense of what time of day you're shooting. A lot of people want to know what time of day, is there a time of day that you prefer to shoot? Most photographers prefer to shoot in golden light, either in the morning or in the afternoon, but I can't tell a ship company when to bring their ship in. So. <laughs> That's, uh, that's great. Uh, also, I can't uh, delay it though, and I can speed it up. In other words, I was in, in the port of Long Beach and I, the ship was going to arrive after sunset and I called the owner of the ship company back here in New York and I said, Nicholas, you've got clean seas, you've got no storms. I need another two knots, please, for the next eight hours uh, so that I have at least an hour and a half to shoot. He says, you know what that's going to cost me? I said, do you know what it's going to cost you if I don't get the photograph? <laughs> so he sped the ship up and it got there exactly when I wanted it. So, so not only are you uh, commissioned by companies to get shots of their boats, but it sounds like everyone's pretty much really on board. And uh, this, this coordinated effort that you talk about, you're not just collaborating with your pilot, but, but the whole ship is involved in making this successful. It is choreography. Uh, there are quite a number of people involved behind the scenes in order to pull off uh, what should feel to the client as well as anyone else seamless. But uh, there's often days of discussions of navigational plans and, and, and uh, specifics to uh, sometimes security issues. Uh, but yeah, there are uh, a number of people who are all in the loop and where I have to touch base with either extensively, whether it's the Sandy Hook pilots, uh, NYPD Aviation, NYPD Marine Intel, uh, the US Coast Guard Sector New York. Um, and, and they, um, with, without them, I couldn't do my job. They are, in a sense, part of my team, all the, uh, because they, they run the show. I'm simply just there to, to weave in and out of it. Well, you've got a lot of fans of your work here and fans of you. Uh, Michael McKee says hello, uh, old college friend of yours, and, uh, uh, and all kinds of other folks who are, who are chiming in here. Uh, we're looking at this great photo. This appears to be morning light looking on the East River. Not a place I tend to think of large ships going so much these days, but uh, a, a place that uh, looking down the harbor toward the Verrazana Narrows. Yep. Um, She's the Scorpio tanker, uh, the Regina. And she had just dropped off a load of, of uh, uh, fuel oil uh, at a terminal in, in the Bronx. I mean, I'm sorry, in Harlem. <clears throat> and um, uh, it is rare. She's not, a, she's not a super large tanker, but she is a product tanker. And she may have six or seven different um, uh, products, whether it be glycerin or naphtha uh, or kerosene or fuel oil. Uh, there's multiple tanks for different clients where she drops off different products. That's uh, I, you know, not something I think we, we all understand. We can, I think a lot of us look at tankers and kind of imagine it's just one big hold. So it's uh, interesting to know they have multiple holds in them. As do uh, barges. I'm sorry? As do barges. It's, it's not just a bucket with a tugboat pushing it. It's, it's, there's multiple products in, in what, called, what are called tank barges. Right, right. 
So here we go. Uh, we're now we're uh, at the Bayonne Bridge, which uh, was recently raised for ships like I think like the one we're looking at here. This again looks like the Theodore Roosevelt, with uh, very unusual to see all the same color box on the ship. Uh, yeah, I mean this was if you see that the ship uh, and her freeboard is fairly high as well. There's probably very little, if anything, in those boxes. It was a photo op for CMACDM. It's a big commitment to a photo op. Uh, we had a question from uh, someone in Seattle wanted to know what port do you find the most picturesque? Um, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no other, no other city has the number of bridges and the complexities. Uh, I mean, Vancouver is pretty amazing, uh, if nothing else, because of the variety of of traffic in the port. Here, our cargo ships are not really seen that much uh, by the public. Right. Uh, they go off into Port Elizabeth and where we're in the, the Kilvan Call, uh, and and they don't really go by the Statue of Liberty like cruise ships do. So it's there, the port is relatively hidden. Vancouver, everything is there. They have more scheduled float plane takeoffs and landings than any other place in the world. Um, they they have yachts and they have uh, cargo ships and it's just an exciting port but it's and there is a bridge um, but it's um, you know there's nothing like New York Harbor and as I said to one client who who was concerned about uh, whether he wanted to have photography done I said well <laughs> you you can't take the Statue of Liberty back to India <laughs> uh so whereas, uh, and I personally, uh, speaking of, of the sort of backdrops and views, and, and I am a great admirer of the view of, of the container cranes with Mount Rainier in the background. So for the person who asked from Seattle, uh, no, no shame there. But uh, uh, in terms of shooting uh, ships, you know, the Kilvan Cull, which is the waterway we're looking at here, uh, and, uh, is really a remarkable place for New York Harbor because you get to be so close to the ships. It's such a narrow piece of water. And there are several places where it's easy to get to the water's edge as a you know, conventional person. Uh, another question is, do you have any tips for photographers wanting to uh, photograph from land? Well, I mean, that's all photography essentially resides around the same principles of knowing what you're looking at and, and uh, uh, holding, I mean, the majority of bad photographs because people don't hold their camera steady. Um, but uh, in terms of photographing ships from land, there's a number of places in New York Harbor, which are the poor man's helicopter, which includes uh, vantage points in Staten Island, uh, the, the, the hilltop at Stevens Institute in New Jersey, um, and, uh, and the, the Kiel Van Cull uh, has, uh, uh, a couple of places where it's just made for made for photography. And with a lot of your shots where you're getting very close to the ship, uh, frankly, the the uh, the pedestrian and bike path on the uh, Bayonne Bridge is an extraordinary vantage point. Uh, I almost feel like uh, I'm getting a similar view to to what you're getting from your helicopter up there. Well, but once you're locked into a spot on a bridge, you aren't going to be able to follow the ship. Right, right. You're a big disadvantage there. Uh, so there is, so we've been looking at container ships and this one that we're looking at, this is even larger than Theodore Roosevelt, isn't it? Um, it's definitely larger. Uh, this is a 15,000 TEU uh, vessel. Um, I, uh, 15, and that's the largest her sister ship was the Brazil that came in about a week before, but um, 15,000 TEUs, uh, and if you want the arcane stuff of what a TEU is, they were essentially uh, started out as 20 footers. If you'll see those small little boxes on the back. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, these are... Those are standard. Those are 20, what are called 20 footers, and the other boxes are generally 40, um, but, and those containers go all the way deep into the ship. But, uh, and there I are- I think we have a photo of that, in fact. Like, the, here, that's, uh, here we go with a, uh, this is a pretty rare perspective and uh, this is not from a helicopter, correct? No, 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 no. I'm, 
I'm on a, a ship I had, had done, I was doing a, a photo assignment for a magazine. And um, uh, it's, it's, you get to see the, the, the innards of how containers are placed. And um, the uh, cargo boss is, I mean, the, the act of knowing the displacement or the, the, the uh, where stuff has to be because they have to go in and they have to come out in time for different ports. Um, it's not just throw it all in and empty it all out. Um, a ship may make several stops before she gets different containers out of there. And there's also, of course, the uh, stability factors of any ship and how it's loaded. And it's a, it's a, it's a magnificent science as well as an art. Uh, we had a question from, looks like Sean Adams wanted to know if you've uh, had to photograph on a stormy sea or other situation where you had safety concerns. Um, there is, in terms of photographing from a helicopter, there, there, I've photographed in 40 knot winds. Um, and I have been on ships as a merchant seaman um, in stormy seas and where the bosun said, Jonathan, do not go out on deck today. Uh, but um, my commercial work is generally um, in the air and um, we have, I've been rained out um, not because the rain is a safety hazard, but because it's just not the pretty picture that, that a client wants. That's an, an important point, yeah. Uh, and, and this photo is just remarkable. Uh, clearly, uh, really fantastic conditions, or it certainly appears that way. Uh, what are we looking at here? Well, in the foreground is the, well, the, both, I mean, the whole picture is the rendezvous, the very unique and special rendezvous of the Queen Mary II. Uh, and uh, Britain's uh, newest aircraft carrier, the, Her Majesty's ship, the Queen Elizabeth. So two exquisite queens are, came into the port. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth came in earlier. Um, the Queen Mary uh, was a several days later. And this photograph, again, is a storytelling. And it's actually the photograph the, the master of the Queen Mary, uh, Captain Chris Wells, prefers because he's seen a zillion pictures of, of the Queen Mary, and um, in this particular sh shot, he the Cunard trademark funnel with the Cunard orange says it all. And uh, the secret to this picture is not to block the Her Majesty ship with with the funnel stack, but to enhance it. Um, and also, yeah, the, no. the aircraft carrier was, was smaller than the Queen Mary, so I had to not. Uh, end up with a picture where the where the aircraft car carrier was diminutive, and we choreographed the two ships so that the Queen Mary did a pirouette around uh, the QE. Wow! And that, that took uh, a great deal of effort to to set that up with both captains, uh, for the Royal Navy captain and and the Queen Mary captain, and and with security issues. Um, and uh, I was the only helicopter allowed to, to fly over the. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth, for sure. Well, one of our regular viewers, Barb, wants to know uh, if, are you familiar with Alan Liddy, who owned a flying camera and specialized in photos uh, from a helicopter uh, for Cunard, Atlanta Container Line, and others in the 80s? I'm aware of the name, but I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't think I've ever met him. Uh, I don't even know if he's alive anymore. Um, there's been, uh, so I'm, I'm not, you know, that familiar with his work other than seeing some of it. Well, going from one stunning photo uh, with really iconic ships to uh, a stunning photo of a ship in an iconic place. Is this the same one we saw before? Again, that East River is, is uh, yeah, it is. okay. Indeed it is. We lucked out. Uh, it was like you, you correctly surmised, it was early morning. We started out way up uh, uh, further north and it was actually the sun was just coming up and it was cold. And it was, this is actually in the winter, you can't tell in this picture, but it was pretty cold inside the helicopter. Um, but the sun was coming up and just popped on the UN building and I uh, couldn't have been happier. Wow, that's really something. And, and the owner of the company. And now this is very different. Here we've been looking at this massive scale uh, with ships. This is a very human scale, but it's, it's uh, to me, you know, this seems almost an abstraction because this, the ship is at such a, a massive scale. But here we, we see people, there's uh, someone under the, the bow of that, uh, uh, the lifeboat, and it looks like refuse bins. 
Uh, this is really remarkable and, and very unusual seeming. Well, I have uh, one friend of mine who calls it my Tetris picture. Huh. Uh, and another friend, uh, actually my twin sister, calls it um, my Mondrian. Uh, and I just love the colors and the blocks and the squares and the, and the geometry of the diagonals, um, as well as the horizontals and the verticals. And it all just works and, um, and uh, it hangs on my wall. Uh -huh. Wow. That's, that's a testament. It's, now, this is kind of what I, I think of is, when I think of your photos, this is really the kind of shot that I tend to think of. Uh, this really dramatic, uh, uh, close to the ship, and uh, just can't, a, sh a shot you can't look away from. Is that, uh, would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, we were 22 feet above the deck uh, in a flying helicopter. Um, and um, my pilot, was begging me to to ask the captain if he could land on on the helipad. Um, why, why did your pilot want to land? Because it's fun. Okay, yeah, it's good. Good reason. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, we didn't do that. Uh, another question: uh, with these incredible shots, what's your ratio? How many shots do you take before you you uh, for how many that you keep? Ooh. Um, well, back in the days of film, does anybody remember that? Uh, the National Geographic sort of unwritten standard was one compelling photograph per, per roll of film, which was 36 exposures. Um, so I, my mind still is, it thinks in, in, in that regard, uh, uh -huh. but I may shoot um, a thousand photographs in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an assignment. And if you divide that by 36, whatever that is, um, and I end up essentially providing a client with several hundred uh, edited pictures. And out of that, uh, we, if, if we get 20 pictures that are massively powerful and unique and different, I'm, I'm very happy. So how did the transition from film to digital uh, change? Did it change the way you work? How, how, what, what happened for you there? Well, I didn't have to uh, be in a toxic dark room, um, <clears throat> and that was a pleasure. Um, but uh, there's no wait time. Um, we back in the days of film, we would have uh, if the client was, we would have motorcycle couriers taking film to East Wing Kodak across um, to to Fairlawn, New Jersey. Um, I can show a client before I land because a lot of cameras have Wi-Fi and otherwise uh, they, they can begin to, to get photographs immediately, if it's particularly with the news value. Um, but uh, you don't have to carry four different kinds of films. Like as if the light goes bad, you don't have to carry, if you're starting out with ASA 25, a punchy film or, or ASA 50, whether it's in those days, Kodachrome or Fujichrome, and then you would carry, um, 10 rolls of backup for Ectrochrome and then high-speed Ectrochrome. And, and you couldn't, you had to have at least three cameras so that you could be prepared. Today with uh, digital sensors, every kind of film is already in your camera. Wow, yeah. So, so what are we looking at here? Is this uh, a fairly typical, it, it, I, again, we're looking down on a ship from what feels like very close to it. Uh, what sets this uh, image apart from others that you've taken? Well, it's rare that you get to see um, docking lines that have not been besmirched by, <laughs> by dirt. And so as I was flying to the ship, I called the captain on my VHF and I said, Captain, could you have your bosun uh, flake out the lines on, on the forecastle?" And he grumbled and he said, how much time do I have? I said, well, we're flying a, with a helicopter costing us about 1400 an hour, uh, about 10 minutes. <laughs> that seems <laughs> and, pretty generous. <laughs> And, but they were delighted because you don't get that opportunity very often to uh, create a diagonals. I mean, and, and the bosun was just amazing. I mean, he just, he, under, he understood. He could have done it in other ways, but he flaked out the lines uh, perfectly. And that, that print hangs in that ship company. It's Independence uh, uh, Maritime and here and based here in New York, as well as Athens. But that is hanging uh, in their main reception room, uh, I think it's 20 by 30 inches. 
So how often does that happen that you make that kind of a special request of a ship? Regularly, uh, simply because um, I understand, I speak ship and I know the nuances, the owners of ships love the nuances of their ships. They love the detail. And there are details that I'm aware of that just someone who's looking for a pretty picture may not be aware of. And I ask them to do things uh, such as opening hatches um, because uh, uh, ships that ply the trade to bulk ships, particularly who ply the trade to say Australia have to have circular uh, ladders that go into the holds. That's their OSHA requirement, so to speak. And so if I open the hatches and I photograph and you can see that circular stairway, the owners are just pleased as punch because, uh, you know, I had one owner say, how did you know that? I said, well, that's why you hired me. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned that you've uh, you had a, a career uh, working on ships, or you worked on ships for a while, and well, and this idea of, of speaking ship, and we sort of understand what that means. But as you tell more stories, it becomes more clear, you know. Um, and and uh, how did your your ability to speak ship did that impact this really dramatic photo we're looking at here? Um, well. This is the kill van call, as we've discussed before, and it's a traffic jam, and there's not a lot of space between the two ships. Uh, I'm very aware, as, as is my pilot, was, and, this, and this one was Dennis Lieber, um, and we were in the piston uh, Schweitzer, and there's a huge amount of turbulence coming from the bow, even though the ships are moving slow, and there's also turbulence between the two ships. Uh, I don't know that my um, speaking ship uh, was as important in these pictures other than being completely mesmerized by the drama um, of two massive ships you know, passing in a very small channel. And I wanted to create a photograph that had that tension. Uh, and uh, my pilot knew what I wanted and put me where I needed to be. Um, if we had stayed much, if we, we actually flew between the two ships and that was probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's just extraordinary, and and seeing these people on the deck of this impossibly huge vehicle, uh, and uh, those those uh, hatches uh, in in this, uh, break, what is that? Uh, it looks like a, a shield for heavy seas. Uh, well, that we're looking at there on the bow. It, it's Cutler. called. Um, it's it's you know the Berlin Wall came down, and these were put up. No. Um, <laughs> But these do protect the ship in theory. I've never seen, uh, but almost ever, even the Queen Mary um, has a V-shaped cut water uh, on her foredeck. Um, older ships uh, often did not. And you know, a 30 foot wave would just, the first time it would break up would be when it was hitting the superstructure uh, of that, the wheelhouse. A uh, couple of questions have come up here. Uh, do you, how and, and do you research ship details? Do you visit ships in advance of the shoot or get details from the owners? Um, I don't visit the ships because they're often out, out at sea. So that would be a little uh, difficult. Um, but uh, I've been on board a number of ships so I know what they look like. I look at, at pictures of them before I shoot. Um, and. Uh, um, if there is research to be done, there's a lot of information about ships. So yeah, I'm, I go prepared. I do my due diligence uh, about every ship and, and particularly what, um, what it's carrying and, and, uh, and the colors of the ship. Because I, I think about the color, if it's, if it's orange, I mean, um, or if it's black hull. I mean, I, I think about that in terms of the, the relationship with the water and the sky and how I'm going to photograph. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lady who's come dressed for the party. And uh, you have to treat her, uh, and every ship has its sweet spot. And so you begin to look at ships uh, as dancers, essentially. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the uh, choreography and dance a bit, but uh, we do go from that incredible dramatic shot of, uh, shot of, of ships passing in the Kelvan Cull. This is another view of the Kelvan Cull. Anyone who's been there uh, knows Cadell's, uh, the dry dock company, uh, been there uh, on the short Staten Island for a long time. And uh, this looks like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other Barbary class ferry boat, the new house. And uh, it's uh, really, 
a great organization here. So is this part of a shoot you did for Cadell? Um, they are a client, but I did this actually for Sam Newhouse, um, uh, the grandson of uh, who the, that ferry boat was, was named after. Um, and, but I, I, I am grateful to Steve Khalil uh, uh, at Cadell's and giving me um, access to uh, Cadell Shipyard, which is just an amazing uh, playground of, of visuals. Absolutely, yeah. And here's a, a, a particularly notable visual that's uh, uh, not a permanent feature of Cadell. This is, uh, they call this the left coast lifter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she's a biggie. Um, that business end of her crane is over 150 feet in the air. And that's one of my client ships, um, Oddfell, um, from Norway, coming up to KVK. Um, and it, it was just happenstance, but um, Oddfell is, is uh, very happy to, to have that photograph. Um, Photographing at Cadell's is generally I'm doing obviously drones. That makes sense because there's uh, so much going on there. And of course, another uh, feature of the Kill Van Call, we have the uh, a lot of the tugboat companies are based there. Uh, these yeah. look like uh, McAllister tugboats. Uh, what, uh, what are we looking at here? Well, this is um, uh, Euronav's monstrous uh, tanker, one of the biggest tankers that have come into New York, at least to my knowledge. Um, carrying 600,000 barrels of Sahara crude. Um, and they called me from Europe saying, uh, uh, Jonathan, will we see the lower Manhattan where the ship has to come in to the Kilbane and call to Bayway to discharge your cargo? I said, not really. I mean, it'll be quite a distance. And said, what do we get to see the Statue of Liberty? And I said, well, no. So they said, what's our choice? I said, call up Buckley McAllister and arranged to have three tugs push that ship where I will tell you where I want her. And, um, and we did that. Uh, the night before it was raining cats and dogs and I had to give, I, I was on, on the hook for a massive expense of, of, of getting that ship where it needed to be. And I called my weather sources and they said, uh, because you have to, you have to, you have to say, to the tugs at least four hours in advance exactly when you're ready to, to have them run. And um, once you pull the, uh, the pin on that, uh, you've, you, whether it's raining or not, you know, the, the clock starts. So uh, fortunately, the rain cleared, the, the weather people said, no, exactly at that time, you'll be fine. It was raining cats and dogs all night. I was biting my nails and, um, it became beautiful. And so we brought the ship up to the lower battery and then we turned her around and made a number of photographs uh, in multiple ways for Euronap. Interesting that uh, for the photographers in the audience who've been asking questions about lighting, uh, this looks like maybe two in the afternoon that uh, just judging by the shadows. Uh, the answer is, uh, I think it was actually uh, late morning by that time. And because okay. if you're, you're looking north and uh, your light is coming, uh, well, in this situation, the light is coming from the west, but I, I'd have to check on the actual season because the light moves around. Sure. Uh, so it could be uh, the light was a little more, if you see the shadow, so it's actually coming from a southern uh, direction, but it was very late in, in morning, if not early afternoon. Yeah, but the but point is that uh, the sun is high in the sky and still we have a really impressive shot of a ship uh, in New York Harbor. And uh, getting a little closer on the tug work here, uh, again, anytime that I see a person, you know, the, the human scale uh, around these ships, I am just absolutely knocked out. Uh, looks like they're, uh, they've are they got a heaving line and they're, they're uh, getting hooked up with the, the, the tug boat in the shop. Well, I, I photographed uh, this uh, for McAllister, and this was the, the Zim Antwerp was the first large container ship to challenge the the new Bayonne Bridge height. Um, and uh, as much as the CMA CGM ship uh, was the 
uh, photo op, uh, Zim Antwerp was really the first and a working ship with, you know, with containers that had stuff in them. Um, but my challenge and my, my mandate from uh, McAllister was show us what we do. And so when you pull a ship that size around Constable Hook or affectionately known as Pond Hook, uh, it's really quite a ballet of tugboats and ship pulling that stern around. And um, that's what there was some there's many other photographs, but yeah, yeah. So we've got some more photos of, of, of that ballet here. I know we only have a few minutes left and we're only about halfway through our shots. So we want to make sure we talk about Sandy Hook pilots before we wrap up today. Yeah, I, I couldn't do and, uh, I'm sorry. I couldn't do what I do without Sandy Hook pilots. They are an amazing, uh, uh, knowledgeable helpful, gracious uh, group of pilots who just um, are just part of my team every day, every, every time I'm in the port. And uh, this uh, this looks like a ship that's delivering container cranes. Yes, uh, and it was to the Port Newark, it was brand new cranes from China on a Chinese uh, um, semi-submersible um, heavy lift ship. And I was uh, actually on Bjorn Kill's uh, media boat to shoot that. This is another sort of unusual looking ship here, uh, also a heavy lift ship, right? Yes, she uh, was in the port to take away a number of tugboats and barges from uh, Rheinauer and um, the Coast Guard got a number of phone calls saying, oh, the ship has sunk. <laughs> well, it, it, it did sink, but purposely, you know, to load the, the ships. And then something a little more typical, the kind of thing I feel like I see every time I look at the harbor, we've got uh, a simple hopper barge with the, uh, a tug pushing along here. Yeah, that's uh, the Sarah, uh, uh, the Sarah Ann, um, and that's a Don John boat. Um, yeah, and, the, bright and blue, uh, the bright blue boats of Don John. And, uh, and then we're looking, this is, I think, probably the most common sight in the harbor here. Uh, what, what is this that we're looking at? This is an articulated tug barge. Uh, with the knot, and so um, this was a shot for uh, um, Bollinger Shipyards, uh, who had just built it, and, it, and they at that time were just putting out barge after barge because of all the the uh, oil and, and, and petroleum that was coming out of all the Canadian pipelines, um, and what essentially made us an exporter of oil, as opposed to uh, not being exported. <laughs> but this so, so, the, so these are ATVs, these uh, 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 articulated tug barges, they're moving uh, petroleum around the harbor. Um, yeah, or to, uh, they're picking up the oil from a, a terminal, from a pipeline generally, and taking it to somewhere else. Uh, this was in the Kilvan call, and I brought the helicopter actually closer than that, because again, the, de you, the details in, of, of these of these vessels are just phenomenal. I mean, I and I love diagonals. <laughs> I've got another diagonal here with uh, Stalwart of the Harbor. We can't uh, talk about the harbor without mentioning the Coast Guard. And uh, we did a whole program on the Coast Guard a while back. I don't know if Andrew wants to drop the link into that program if you want to know more about Coast Guard. Uh, which, uh, do you know much about this particular vessel? Well, she's, she's a, a, a vessel that's been very well known in the harbor. Her, She's the Sturgeon Bay, and uh, she um, uh, she she does patrol work uh, throughout the um, the harbor, and and this is actually a group of stalwarts. This was the uh, day that the U.S. Navy New York uh, came in, and and this is quite a number of of, of friends of mine who are in, uh, in different waterfront organizations, and and I. I was I, I called the, the the pilot on the boat and I said, "Do you need your bow painted?" I was <laughs> close. Wow, wow. And of course, cruise ships are a big feature of the harbor. Uh, wow, uh, that's that's a heck of a shot you've got there. Is this the Verrazano? It is. Um, it's Celebrity's Millennium, and uh, it was just fortunately a very very calm day, and I just like that sense of tangential. Tangential, tangential. Well, anyway, the yeah, the, the, the anticipation 
of um, a, of movement. It's almost sort of like Mike, Michael Jordan right before he releases the ball. Um, it's that sense of tension between a moving object and a non-moving object or whatever, because once she gets under the bridge, it's sort of, it's already happened. And, right, right. And I'm sitting there with the helicopter, holding my position, just waiting for it. And a whole other kind of uh, drama and tension here, uh, just really unusual view of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's remarkable. It was uh, uh, done for Royal Caribbean. This was the freedom of the sea, so it was appropriate to have an icon uh, that also spoke of freedom um, in, in the picture and differently than it, than it had been photographed regularly. I, I, there's no question that people have photographed the statue from her backside, um, but uh, uh, I just thought it was, it was appropriate for this. And that photograph, according to the uh, Royal Caribbean's uh, uh, Weber Shamrick uh, and, Ren and Renee Mack um, said it was the most Googled cruise ship picture of its time. Ah. All right, now we have the Sandy Hook pilots aforementioned. And uh, 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 so we'll, we'll talk about what they do and, and who they are here. Uh, so this is a, a pilot either, uh, looks like they're leaving a ship after bringing it into the harbor. Is, is that correct? Yeah, uh, actually the, the the person on the gangway uh, in the lead is uh, Karen, is, is Captain Karen Bassiano uh, of Sandy Hook Pilots. And there's an apprentice who is uh, appropriately walking behind her or <laughs> behind her. Uh, and um, Sandy Hook Pilots is, is every, every port throughout the world requires um, pilots to bring in ships because a captain may or may not, may not necessarily know the local regulations and, and, or the navigation. So um, every ship requires a pilots and the Sandy Hook pilots have, were started in, in 1694. They're one of the oldest uh, um, groups of uh, the oldest um, maritime organization that's been continuous. Um, they've, over the years, they, I mean, they were the New Jersey pilots and, but they became united and um, um, they serve all the ships and, what they know, I mean, they uh, to be a pilot, it's almost seven years or more than seven years of training where they have to, on a blank piece of paper, draw out every every aspect of the harbor from memory. Just incredible. I've, I've run into some of those documents at the Siemens Church Institute archives. It's, uh, yeah, their work is extraordinary. And, and here is uh, their big uh, pilot uh, number one and in a scene that we've referred to uh, before. Uh, so, so how does this boat work into the Sandy Hook pilots operations? How does it fit? Well, she's sort of the mothership for all the goslings. Uh, she's the big, she stands, she sits out generally at Ambrose Light um, and waits for the ships to come in and she houses uh, a number of pilots who are waiting to board incoming ships. And with her are usually three or four, what Sandy Hook pilots calls motorboats, um, which are the smaller vessels that then go up alongside a ship and the pilot goes up uh, the Jacob's ladder or the, uh, in order to um, uh, board the ship and, and bring her into New York. So she's, she has uh, bunks and a full galley and and I've actually lived on that boat for a week. It's huh. it's it's uh, and there's a new boat that's being uh, prepared and and uh, that is about I would say fifty percent bigger with a huh. helicopter deck and everything else. But um, well, before we get further into talking about Sandy Hook pilots, uh, Bob wanted to know what the towers are on the naval ship in the background. Uh, you have to ask the Navy. All right, and Andrew may know that answer better than I do. I know Andrew's uh, who's doing the, uh, the chat there. He's uh, well versed in uh, uh, in uh, naval maritime story. Uh, also, uh, that, that is the New York, and she was coming in to be christened here in New York. She is carrying seven tons of World Trade Center steel in her bow, and she's a stealth ship. And the captains on the Sandy Hook boat. Uh, said that on their radar, even though she was only a few hundred yards away, uh, her footprint was of a fishing vessel. Wow. wow. And the angles and the faceting uh, of that ship 
reflect off radar in different ways that are weird. Uh, this is Barry G uh, Gary Bascom, and he drives one of the utility boats for Sandhook Pilots, and and uh, there's just a lot of choreography of, of of bringing the pilots from the ships or from Ambrose Light or bringing them back to uh, Sandy Hook headquarters or picking them up elsewhere. And he's he's a busy boat driver. So one of the people connecting that that uh, base ship that you that mother goose ship that you talked uh, about. Or, uh, yeah, or and or picking pilots up from other places. But yeah, he's he's essential. You know, our seafarers, whether they're uh, brown water or blue water, are essential workers in this world. Four hundred thousand seafarers are somewhat stranded because they because of the pandemic they can't get off their ships and rotate crews. And yeah, it's a serious serious issue, but. Seafarers are the people who bring you your food and your your PEI or your PPI, whatever it's called. The, the PPE, yes, yeah. All that. <laughs> I mean, these these all are, that stuff. They they are like critical to our global economy. Yeah, for people paying attention, we've been hearing like I, every day. I think I hear another story about people uh, seafarers stranded on their ships, and and whether brown, uh, the inland waters, or or blue water. And we also hear uh, stories, a couple of stories this year, uh, about pilots and the dangers that they face. Uh, this photo seems to capture some of the the drama and the danger of uh, life as a Sandy Hook pilot. What, what are we looking at here? Well, that's Captain Edward Sweeney, and he is boarding from one of the motorboats. Uh, the ship, and um, uh, actually, it's a fairly short Jacob's ladder, um, and but it's the it's unfortunately one of the weakest links of of pilotage in getting your pilots uh, on board a ship. And, um, and uh, now we're going to look at uh, some individuals, both uh, Sandy Hook pilots and captains, a couple in our last couple minutes here. Well, this is Captain John DeCruz. He is the president of Sandy Hook pilots. And uh, I photographed him in my sort of general patent pose. But um, he is he is just an amazing, amazing seafarer and captain. And and he's um, in charge of, you know, he's the president of, of Sandy Hook pilots. I, uh, he is, he is, I'm indebted to him because um, without his help and assistance, I don't have the type of information that, that permits me to access and get and fly to ships to be on time and to, and to be there when I need to be there. Key part of your dance. And uh, is this a, another, no, it's all right. Uh, looks like we're looking at a, another Sandy Hook pilot, but in a military setting here. Well, yeah, this is on the, um, the, the LHD-7, the Iwo Jima for Fleet Week. And um, uh, <clears throat> this is Captain W.J. Ferry, uh, who's the Navy liaison pilot for Sandy Hook, uh, Sandy Hook pilot. So he's on the bridge and as, as I am. And what, what, who do we have here? Well, this is uh, the McAllister docking pilot, Captain Jeffrey McAllister, who's uh, on, uh, and um, I kind of like the picture because it's the, the Navy officer in, in dress whites for, for uh, Fleet Week is they're both on phones. <laughs> and, uh, and the angle, uh, it's, you know, it's just, it's part of the human element of, of, of being on the bridge. And docking pilot is a whole other job from the Sandy Hook pilot. Yeah, uh, I mean they're they're um, generally involved in that to, to not coin a phrase the last mile uh, where they're bringing the ship in the berth and they're and because he is of the McAllister organization um, he's the one directly talking to the tugboats and uh, this also looks like a formal occasion with another uh, Sandy Hook pilot I presume well this is. Um, a very important moment. This was the tenth anniversary of 911, and they brought again the U.S. Navy ship New York into New York Harbor, and uh, um, the commander of the uh, uh, of the Navy ship, Commander um, uh, Herman, um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, William Herman was. We got up right. I stayed overnight on the ship, and uh, Neil Keating. Uh, Captain Neil Keating of Sandy Hook uh, was 
given the honor to bring that ship in for the 10th anniversary because uh, his brother, Paul, was one of the uh, fire department in New York uh, casualties uh, due to the um, tragedy of, of the World Trade Center. So Neil um, was given the honor to bring that ship in on the 10th anniversary. And so I photographed them both on the bridge, probably within one minute of when that event happened. Wow, that's, that's tremendously moving. Um, and uh, is this a, a pilot as well on this photo? No, no, no. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the behind the scenes events is simply that uh, the NYPD Marine Intelligence, and this is Detective uh, Kevin Gallagher, who's actually retired, but he um, he's in charge of the, of the massive security issues of any high profile ship. And he's often on the bridge and he's often calling me on the radio. Uh, in, normally I'm in a helicopter, uh, but Kevin is, um, was, is absolutely critical in, in the harbor. And he's standing next to the captain of the Queen Mary II, and that's uh, Captain Chris Wells. Um, and it was just a, a terrific moment. Uh, they've both known each other for a long time. And, and I've, I've known Captain Chris Wells since the 60s when he was a staff captain on the QE2. And I've been working worked with Kevin Gallagher um, for quite a long time. And uh, special, special people, both of them. And uh, some folks in our audience noticing Governor's Island in the background there across Buttermilk Channel from the usual birth for the Queen Mary II. Yeah, well, she was pulling up. And this is it. We got a familiar face here. Uh, this is a guy I know from uh, the Harbor School. Indeed, this is Captain Aaron Singh. And um, this was shot a number of years ago uh, when, but uh, um, I was impressed with, with Captain Singh uh, on a small issue. And that is that by law, every captain before you move your, your vessel you have to give an orientation speech of where the light preservers are and uh, safety issues and not to walk around the deck when we're, we're coming into a pier or whatever. And Aaron's delivery was one of the best deliveries of that orientation speech I'd ever heard. <laughs> it feels like a cognate to uh, appreciating a flight attendant for their, uh, their opening uh, choreographed dance. Uh, but uh, um, I, I get what you're saying. That, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and uh, he was wearing the Amistad hat. Andrew notes uh, that uh, the uh, ship based in New Haven. Yes, the, the replica. It's called the replica ship Amistad. <laughs> now we're on the bridge of a ship in this photo in just our last couple of moments here. Uh, which uh, what ship is this that we're on the uh, bridge this of? This is um, a McAllister tugboat. Oh. And um, uh, it's uh, essentially the um, uh, Barbara McAllister, which doesn't exist anymore. And that's Pat Kinnear in the foreground, who is McAllister's port captain um, and um, critical to essentially choreographing and all the work efforts that all their fleet is doing from day to day. Um, and uh, behind him is the, the captain of that particular tugboat, and uh, that's Ross, Russ Henchman, who now has um, been promoted to uh, uh, a McAllister docking pilot. Oh, wow. So, you know, he's, and we were uh, out there, um, actually that was that tugboat, we were uh, on board when we were loading um, or involved in the, um, that heavy lift ship or that semi-submersible putting the uh, tugboats and barges. Yeah. Uh, when in our final minute here, as we look at uh, this looks like Brian and Buckley McAllister. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is there a ship you haven't shot yet? That's your dream assignment. Um, the, the nuclear powered Savannah, which sits in Baltimore. Uh, she's not likely to run, but that she's just such a centrally beautiful ship. And I'm, um, I'm in charge. I'm in touch with Marad to give me permission to, to uh, perhaps fly a drone over it. I hope that happens for you. 
And uh, here we have a great view of the, the harbor, uh, taking in everything from Brooklyn to Jersey City with a ship that looks like it works pretty hard here in the foreground. Uh, she uh, uh, actually um, had, was bringing uh, crude oil from these massive uh, tankers that uh, essentially park about 100 miles off of Atlantic City. They're just too big to come in the harbor. And she's bringing crude uh, into the Kilvan Cull. And since I mentioned uh, Neil Keating on the New York, Neil called me because uh, I was shooting another ship and he said, hey, Jonathan, I'm on the, uh, the Amazon Beauty. Uh, can you grab a, a shot of her? And, and, uh, and I did. And um, he was bringing that ship in the same day that I was, the same hour that I was shooting another ship. So Neil, Neil just called me on the radio and said, hey, you know, I see you. So can you get it? <laughs> I mean, well, uh, that's that was a gorgeous photo, and and uh, we're wrapping it up with uh, your your contact information here. I know Andrew's been putting your uh, links in the the chat. Uh, anything else that you want to leave us with before uh, we say goodbye today? The people I work with in the seafaring and the cargo, as well as the cruise ship industries, are some of the most knowledgeable, amazing, erudite professional workforce I have ever, ever had the pleasure of being with. And I, there, it's a special camaraderie and a special sense of incredible knowledge that they bring to what they do. And we all benefit from that. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you bringing your knowledge and your professionalism and passion uh, and, and your extraordinary talent to Turnstile Tours virtual program today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, getting to know the harbor through your eyes. And I hope uh, folks will uh, you know, pay attention to your work as we move forward. And uh, I will look forward to seeing more of your work in the future, including those shots of the Savannah that you mentioned. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. It's been a, an honor and a pleasure to uh, be asked by Turnstile uh, to be on this program. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. And uh, all of you in the audience, thank you for joining us. We couldn't do it without you. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, till then, take care. <laughs>